Okay, then let's dive right in. So here are, is the material that I want to uh, cover today. Um, I want to talk about vertical looping. I mean, you already saw this yesterday, but now I want to make this really explicit, explain what options you have there. Um, we have also already heard that Dawn is a strictly typed language, like you need to list all your intended types before you run your code. So we talk about type consistency more formally. And uh, then it's already time for short question and answers. And after this, I will talk about reductions, which is then probably the most important concept which we offer in Dusk and Dawn. And then conclude this briefly with, uh, with conditionals, because of course we need to talk about conditionals as well. So just as a quick reminder, uh, so here we have a extremely basic uh, Dusk program, which is a copy stencil. So um, we copy some input field located on vertices on uh, output field located consequently also on vertices. And I just want to quickly go over the structure imposed by Dusk here. We start out with the signature where we have the uh, function name and, well, a list of the arguments. After this, we have the vertical domain where we also specify the intended loop order, uh, more on this later. And we have a list of statements. Uh, this is like the actual payload where the stuff we want to execute is executed. So diving into this a little bit more, we have the loop over the vertical, which is here listed explicitly. We say that we want to go our, uh, over our levels in upward fashion at this time. And Dawn will try to emit code which runs this in parallel. And what tries to means will be formalized in just a little bit. And then we have the list of statements, which are also run in parallel, like uh, this input equals, sorry, this output equals input is not only a single assignment, like it assigns uh, values all over the domain, right? All over the horizontal domain. And this in Dawn is always run in parallel, like the horizontal domain is always parallelized. Okay, but talking about the uh, vertical looping um, uh, more extensively now. So we have our copy stencil on the right again, and we can see that we have this uh, with levels upward statement. And the first thing I would like to note and mention is that you are not allowed to nest these uh, with level statements. So you're not allowed to design a double loop, uh, like in K squared. Uh, over your vertical by by nesting uh, two with levels upwards or two with levels downwards statements. This is something which we would not support. Again, you may not care in a lot of instances, but still you are required to say whether or not you want to loop upwards or downwards throughout your domain. So you have these two options. Um, and then also just as important, you're allowed to give the a vertical loop index a name. So in all our examples, we are calling this K, but you are also free to call this level or whatever you prefer. And subsequently, you can use this loop variable to address fields and to address fields only, like you're not allowed to further modify the uh, loop variable to increase it further or whatever. Um, so yes, you can use this to read as a field, but like output equals input k would be pretty pointless because this is already implied, like you can do this or you can leave it, whatever you prefer. But you can also use this to read horizontally offset, like you can read one level above u, and well, by u I mean the current level, you can read uh, one above or one below, or two above or three below, or whatever, like every compile, compile time literal is fine. What is never fine is trying to read, off, uh, sorry, write offset. You're um, not allowed to introduce a horizontally offset write. Um, yeah, because basically there is um, no safe way to parallelize this. 
And the last thing you're allowed to do is, well, nobody forces you to execute every computation on every level of the domain. So here on the right hand side was this slice notation, um, which is well MATLAB like and I believe also Fortran like implies is that you start at level five and you iterate up to the fifth level from the top. Okay, um, I think nothing too involved here. Um, I just briefly want to show how this would um, be translated by Dawn. So I'm always, in all of my examples, I'm gonna use a uh, pseudocode notation, uh, which I hope is more or less intuitive to uh, all the uh, persons in the training. Um, so what we see here is that this dusk code on the left, because we have an explicit loop over the vertical and we have the implicit loop over the horizontal, we would get a double loop in our um, serial pseudocode and also my serial pseudocode or later parallel pseudocode has this meshing library, which has well basic mesh operations, like it returns me the number of vertices here to form the inner loop. And now in this case, because this is such a trivial example, Dawn will be able to execute parallel force um, for both the inner and the outer loop. So this parallel force, they are sort of magic and they would just imply a parallel for loop in either OpenMP or CUDA um, or whatever backend you would be using. Okay. So let's talk um, a little bit more about what we mean that Dawn tries to parallelize this. So we have seen that there is sorry, vertical offsets. And these vertical offsets imply vertical data dependencies. And there will be some forms of stencils which cannot be parallelized anymore if you write stuff with certain um, vertical dependency patterns. Um, however, for now, you can assume that this basically does not happen. Like for now, you're free to assume that Dawn will be able to parallelize every vertical loop. We will see uh, situations where this is not possible at the very end of the day today. So to reiterate this, whether a stencil says levels downwards or level upwards is of no consequence uh, for you. So you could imagine that this says with levels parallel. And this is also a non-issue for all the exercises we are gonna have. So in all exercises, there, the with level statement is already in there, but you, if you're so inclined, you could change this to levels downwards or upwards, whatever you're pleased. Uh, this is doubly true because uh, all our exercises today will only consider one vertical uh, level. So, um, yeah, there are no misunderstandings there either way. Okay. Um, let's look at vertical loopland, looping in conjunction with safety. So we have seen this copy stencil before where we copied a input to an output. And now we have just a very slightly more involved example. Uh, this time around we are shifting instead of copying, like we have the K plus one here. So this means that we are gonna look at one level above and shift it one level down for each level. And we're also trying to be clever here and we're saving some memory. So we do not have an input and output field, but we have this one in out field, which is not const, but is being read from and written to. And in this case, this is fine. It does what we, what we are intending because we have a K plus one, which is also the direction in which we are traveling. So this should do what we are intending it to do. It should just shift the whole domain one level down. Okay, fair enough. So you wrote that stencil and you made sure that your whole numerical uh, algorithm is doing what you intended. So how it usually goes, you write your serial stuff, you make sure it's right, and then you try to squeeze out the performance. 
and you want to parallelize this. So here is what you come up with. And yeah, depending on how much uh, parallel code you wrote in your life, you will either see immediately or after you think about it uh, for a little bit that this is not safe. Like this is a race condition because um, depending on whether, well, let's assume that each thread is handling a few K levels, right? And depending on whether the thread above you has already written its level, you're either going to read a updated value or a stale value. So every time, if your scheduling is not deterministic, this code will return a different state in the in-out variable. Okay, so let's, fair enough. So this is dangerous code. So let's look at the same thing, but this time we are writing it in Dusk and with the intention of feeding this into Dawn. So Dawn is a parallelizing compiler. So now we would assume that Dawn does something in this situation. And we would expect Dawn to uh, do something else than just like um, uh, blindly compiling it. So what option does Dawn have? So Dawn could say, this is not safe. I'm, I'm not going to tr uh, transpile this, compile this for you. It could warn you very sternly, albeit be it, I would say that would be a very bad option. Um, or Dawn could try to make it safe for you. So let's just see what happens. So here we have the code on the left hand side. We feed this into Dawn and right away we can see that Dawn did not like just translate this as it is on the left hand side. Um, so what we can see is the first thing is that Dawn on its own decided to allocate another field. And we can see that Dawn is filling that field in a first step and then reading from that field in a second step, but only after it introduced a sync as well. So here we are waiting for all threads. And then only after all threads have reached that barrier, we're continuing with the second block. So in summary, Dawn noticed that something is up here, that something needs to be done. So uh, maybe I will formalize this just a little bit. So Dawn noticed a data dependency. It made a temporary copy of the input field, which is a pass which we call field versioning. Dawn also ensured that versioning the field, like copying the data into that field, was run in parallel to get the maximum performance. And then finally, in this uh, second substantial or whatever you want to call that, it made the shift and it made the shift safely in parallel. So and this is just one situation where Dawn is not only a, a productivity tool or a performance tool, but it's also a, it's, um, also a safety tool in a lot of situations. And speaking of safety, there is like two kinds of safety, right? There is the runtime safety, where we have just seen an example of, and there is also safety you can already enforce at compile time, like before the code is even run. And type checking and type safety is about the latter, about safety you can imply before even running the code. And well, Dawn is strictly typed, but if you're just looking at the simple types, and we will see more complex time later in the afternoon, but for the simple types, the type system in Dawn is well simple. It's simple enough for all types to fit on this slide. So basically you have the three horizontal fields, which either reside on vertices, on edges, or on cells. We can also have a field or maybe a pseudo field, uh, which is just a single column. So we remember yesterday where we made clear that the NWP meshes are always arranged in this column. So a vertical field is always meaningful in our codes. But anyways, you can specify such a field by not defining a vertical extent as you did before, but you only define the horizontal. Okay, now I misspoke, it's the other way around. 
you do not specify a horizontal extent as above, but you specify a vertical one, which is just the uppercase level K, level K in our um, uh, in our programming language. And of course, you can have full fields, three-dimensional fields, by specifying both the horizontal and the vertical extent. Um, okay, so now we talked about the type in the sense of the locations, like where these fields are. So a edge field, which is defined like this, this colon field brackets edge, we say all the values are located on edges, but we are not telling you the type of these individual values, right? They could be anything. And currently and unfortunately, we only support floats. So all fields are float fields. And you can say whether you want 32 bits or 64 bits, but not in the programming language, but you need to do this in the driver. Like in the driver, you need to emit a define, um, which tells then the platform specific compiler to compile in 32 bit floats or 64 bit floats. So which also means that there is no mixed precision. So you will either have single precision or double precision if you are writing code in Dusk. And this is something which we are very aware of and uh, we want to uh, go obviously further in the future. Uh, we want to have at least, uh, well, all the primitives, right? We want to have integers and pools as well. Maybe even characters or strings, but I wouldn't know what this is useful for. And we also want to have small vectors, like we want to say that on this edge stores a, a velocity vector, for example, with two or three components. So currently you need to emulate this. If you have the velocity on the edges, you need to introduce two edge fields, one having containing the X component, the other containing the Y component. Okay, so let's look at a few examples, what the type system is doing. We have this copy stencil again, and this is obviously okay. We have both fields and edges. We assign the input to the output, and Dawn is gonna accept, accept this, and we're good to go. Now, if you try the same thing, uh, we'll get a type error. It's gonna say assignment at line whatever, is inconsistent, is false, because we cannot assign a cell field to an edge field. Here, just a little bit com more complex, but still simple. We are adding two fields up and assigning to the result to a left-hand side, all on edges, so don't see it's no problem. It emits codes happily. Um, however, you're also not allowed to add fields on different location types. So Dawn is going to complain. It's going to say that there is a type of error in a binary op, namely an addition. OK, now it's important to note that none of this is exclusive to Dawn or Dusk or even uh, especially special or something. Um, you can write type safe codes in most any language. Uh, however, at least in my experience, if I look at model code, it appears to me that it's often written in an unsafe way. Like a typical way um, a model programmer could implement the addition we have seen, like the bugged addition, the wrong addition on the last slide, is doing this. It's like, um, it's like the programmer would just allocate three double arrays and then a loop over the edges doing the addition. Um, however, here is a clear problem. Um, we have the array B, which has only of, is only of length cells, but we are iterating over the number of edges, right? And because there are typically less cells than there are edges in any reasonable mesh, we would read outside the bounds of B. So if you're lucky, you would get a sec fault here. And if you're unlucky, you would just read from other paged in memory um, and read something random, random, maybe from another allocated field, which may be very hard to spot at runtime. 
So here I just want to stress that you can do you can make this safe. You can make the safe, for example, in C by just allocating fields with a type and then either overloading the uh, bracket operator or introduce this add function, which just takes iterators of the correct type. And then this would fail safely at compile time. And just to make this, uh, I'm sure that um, most anybody knows this, but this has no runtime implications because type checking is done at uh, compile time and a sane compiler can emit code for this, which is just efficient as the compiler can emit code for, for that formulation. Okay, take home here would just be that we are, have type safety in Dawn, but it's not limited to Dawn, but also a lot of model code is not written in type safe manner. Okay, now we talked um, about location, like about these edges and vertices and um, cells and whatnot. But um, I already hinted at that there is also dimensionality, right? We can have fields which only go along the vertical, we can have fields which only go along the horizontal, and we can have full fields. And now I hope this is not too confusing, but I use um, the term one dimensional field for vertical fields as well, or interchangeably, and I interchangeably use um, the term two dimensional field for a horizontal field, and again, interchangeably a 3D field for a full field, so to speak. So again, this may be slightly confusing because both vertical fields and horizontal fields are arrays of rank one whereas a 3D field would be uh, an array of rank two. But yeah, I, I hope this is fine, that this terminology is, is not um, too clean. But anyways, here we have like this admissibility matrix, what is fine to assign uh, to what. Um, obviously, it's always fine to um, assign a field of the same dimensionality, but a 3D field may also um, take on the right hand side a field of lower dimension, which basically just uh, copies the fields either in slices or um, over slices in the, in the 1D case. So to make the semantics clear, I just put the uh, pseudocode for both options uh, on the bottom of this slide. Um, for binary operations, we, we don't really care. We just uh, take the, we just introduce the iteration variable which makes sense and we add this up in the, in the emitted code. So adding a 2D field to a 1D field and assigning this to a 3D field is totally fine. Okay, let's quickly recap. So what can we do? We can copy fields around. We can do this in a vertically shifted way if we want. And we can do arithmetic on fields as long as all the fields are located on the same location. Um, okay, and this would be all I want to cover for this very first session. And I think now we would quickly go to questions if there are some. Um, maybe Chakamo? Can you relay yeah. any questions to me if there are any? Okay, we already have um, at least two questions. Uh, we start from the first one uh, from Will. Um, in your simple copy example, output equals input, the implication is that input and output are scalars in, a, in the thread and the operation is applied over the uh, horizontal domain. Will it be difficult to extend the concept to allow input and output to be small matrices where the operation is then performed again over the horizontal domain? You mentioned that this extension is foreseen. Uh, what is the time frame? Here I am thinking about support for discontinuous Galerkin, where instead of grid points, you have grid elements. Yes, um, I mean, I hope I brushed upon this when I said that we are aware that like the uh, individual elements currently can only be scalars and floats, right? But we would uh, want to extend this 
two small vectors. And obviously, if you're already doing this, especially if you have, have to type that small vectors uh, for these things, it's very conceivable that we are also going to um, have small matrices which can live on the individual edges or on the individual cells, uh, which is probably more interesting for the Yerkin stuff. Um, as for the time frame, I am currently not sure. Maybe, Giacomo, do you have something in the back of your head when we wanted to attack this? But, well, obviously next year, but I'm not sure when. I don't know. Yeah, I'd say, um, yeah, this is in our to-do list, but um, yeah, we, we still have some um, higher priority. Uh, but then, of course, yeah, it, I think this yeah. um, is not so let's, a let's just, problem. So let's just say Horizon 2021 or something like this. Okay, um, the next question again from Will. Uh, you're right that 2D fields are generally horizontal fields, uh, for example, surface pressure, but in many circumstances, there are also 2D horizontal vertical fields, um, like zonal means. How are these addressed uh, in Dusk? Um, I'm currently not too sure what a, a horizontal vertical field is. Um, uh, yeah, I also don't understand uh, that part. Um, um, yeah, maybe we, we can wait for a clarification. Uh, in the meantime, I read the third question from uh, Daniel. Is it possible to specify loop bounds in the horizontal as well, uh, like in order to loop only over a nudging zone or lateral boundary zone? Um, the... Yes, it's possible, but it's not currently possible. Um, Dawn already supports it, but uh, we don't have exact feature parity between Dusk and Dawn. So currently you cannot um, specify it in Dusk, but if you really, really want to, you can uh, modify the SAR by hand to do this. I wouldn't recommend it, but it is. it will be become possible very soon. Yeah, so for, for time frame for this is, uh, uh, yeah, very soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so let's uh, wait a bit until we have the clarification. So, okay, the uh, clarification is, uh, clarification is uh, not a 3D field. Uh, so on a lat long grid, average all values along one latitude. This gives you a 2D field in longitude and levels. Uh, okay, I believe I understand it now. Like you would have longitude and levels. So it would be something like an IK field or something like this in, um, in uh, Cartesian lingua. And I'm not quite sure whether this concept makes sense in the unstructured world. Like maybe if you have a completely structured triangular mesh, then this would be conceivable. But in Dawn, even though we are in a very close to structured situation, we are um, designing Dawn in such a way that it would work in an unstructured world like that you do not necessarily have a well-defined left hand, right hand neighbor to each of your elements. So no, I don't think that we would have uh, support for, for fields as you are suggesting. Okay. okay. Um, should we take uh, maybe another question, uh, Matthias, or if... do you think we are uh, out of time respect to your... No, I don't think we are at all out of time. I mean, we have until 10.30. Okay. Um, or... So I, I, I think I take um, a question from uh, Sebastian. Is there any way of getting data from a 3D to a 1D, 2D field? Since directly assigning is not allowed, is there an option to use slicing or reductions? Um, can you repeat it, please? 
um, okay, is there any way of getting data from a 3D to a 1D or 2D field? Since directly assigning is not allowed, is there an option to use slicing or reductions? Yes, uh, interesting question. Um, we discussed this for quite a bit uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and we toyed with the idea of introducing a slice concept to, of uh, just doing this. It's currently not really on our table because as far as we can see uh, in the icon die core, or at least in the icon die core, we are, par we are interested in translating. There does not seem to be a clear cut use case for this or we are missing it. But um, currently, no, there is no such concept. So in, if you really need to do this, then you would probably need to rely on do it in driver code right now. Um, yeah, OK, maybe uh, so I can add here. Um, I mean, although, yeah, we, we don't have the use case for this for now. Uh, I don't think this would be much difficult to, to implement throughout the, the old food chain. So no, I mean, we could, speak. yeah, you could still lift the restriction in the in the type checker and then uh, omit the appropriate code, right? If this is really, but yeah, I'd, I think we thought that this is somehow too implicit and we wanted the user like saying that they really want to do this by having this slice concept. But yeah, this is maybe, yeah, really attention to you. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I believe we would have still time to take ten minutes if we want. And okay. So, um, so before the break, we were just talking about uh, operations like uh, on point wise operations, like operations that. Um, are performed on each point individually. And um, this is typically not enough. Um, what we really would want to support is the concept of a compact stencil, which is more general, but roughly it means that in a compact stencil, we are, we are trying to algebraically combine values not only located at the central point, but uh, also values located at adjacent points for some definition of adjacency. And this concept is probably most well known from finite differences where we have this example, which we are well always using because it's so simple. You can uh, construct a second order accurate uh, Laplacian approximation to a, a scalar field uh, using this very simple equation. And here uh, Fij would be the central point and the f i plus one, f j plus one, f i minus one, and f j minus one would be the adjacent points. And we are obviously uh, building a algebraic combination of all of these values. Um, yeah, here we have essentially just uh, repeated what I just said verbally. Um, the special thing about the Cartesian mesh is that you can very easily um, address your adjacent points by just stating these offsets, like j plus one is your value to the top because you always have a well-defined uh, top, bottom, left, and right. And this is not true for FEM meshes, or at least uh, more general, or, or more general FEM meshes. It might work out on some, but not on all FEM meshes. Um, and while this is not the most basic FD stencil, it's still a very basic FD stencil. And since I not, do not know how many people know of, um, what the most basic FVM stencil looks like, I would like to quickly derive it. So here we have a conservation law. And we omit all the source terms, so the right-hand side is just going to be zero. And what we're doing in finite volumes is, as the name implies, we are cutting up our space in finite volumes. And these finite volumes are small, but still of finite size. And we are claiming that they are small enough that you, 
this quantity which we want to conserve is constant over these small volumes. And then we are free to integrate our uh, conservation law over these small volumes individually. And here under the line in the middle, we are doing just that. And then under a second term, we can see the divergence. And because this is divergence of an unknown function, and we don't really want to do this, or we can't do this conceptually, we can apply the divergence theorem, which is a theorem I showed you in the very first session. So all that is produced in this volume omega needs to flow over the boundary of omega. So this transforms the volume integral effectively in a surface integral, this time denoted by delta omega, to um, signify the boundary of our finite volume omega i. Right on this slide, on the top, just restating what I said before. Um, here we're doing a very basic trick. So we assumed that u is constant over the volume, right? So we can pull it out of this integral. Uh, please note that it's not constant in time. I just dropped the argument t for convenience. So it actually is constant in space, but only over small volumes. But it's still not constant, assumed to be constant in time or anything like that. So, and the volume integral all over a volume is just the volume. Then rearranging this to get the time derivative on the left-hand side and all the other stuff on the right-hand side at the bottom here, repeating it at the top. And then since we know our finite volumes and our finite volumes have simple geometrical shapes, we can now attack this surface integral by numerical um, quadrature, for example, in the most simplest case, um, when we are in 2D, then we are just going to walk around our cell. And to find the ds, we are just going to multiply by the length of that edge. And we need to sum this up. And then we get an approximation uh, to this, con uh, to the conservation equation we had before. And one thing we can see here already is that there are some cell quantities and there are some edge quantities in the same equation. So the limitations which we still had before the break are definitely not enough to even reflect the most basic FVM computation. So we somehow need to support this. And these kinds of compact stencils, we at MetaSwiss call reductions. And these kinds of reductions are um, as important to FVM as these uh, north, south, east, west stencils are to finite differences. And this is why we are treating these reductions um, as a very first class citizen in our programming language. I would say it's the most important primitive we offer. And when we are, while we are perusing the Icon Dicor, we noticed that the reductions of these kind in the Icon Dicor implemented in Fortran are very general. So we tried to find a very permissive and very general implementation of that concept. And I believe what you have already even seen from the equation is that these reductions are closely linked to the concept of neighborhood like we had a quantity on a cell and we had three neighboring quantity uh, on the edge neighbors of that cell. So quickly repeating what we learned about meshes yesterday, well, just stating the really obvious that there are vertices, edges and cells. And then maybe just as obvious is that there are neighborhood relations between these quantities, like a vertex borders on six cells and six edges whereas an edge borders on two cells and two vertices, and a cell borders on three vertices and three edges. So these are all the neighborhood relations for now. So for this morning, we are only gonna talk about these six, and we are talk about in, we are gonna be talking about more general neighborhoods later in the afternoon. 
And these neighborhoods are neighborhoods you can potentially reduce over. These are the neighborhoods which define your iteration space. And because, well, this is pretty defining of a reduction, we decided to make this the first argument of our reduce over concept. Okay, so at the bottom, you already see a reduce over concept in Dusk. And now I briefly want to dissect its uh, syntax. So first we give the neighborhood to iterate over as discussed. Then we give the operands. This is what we want to do at each point of our operation. Then we say what we want to do with the individual operands to reduce them. In this case, we want to sum them up. So we just stay, state the token sum. And we have an additional value. So here we are, want to start a uh, summation with zero. And because most of the reductions we encountered in the die core uh, are summations, we decided to introduce a shorthand. So instead of always having to specify that you want the sum and start with zero, you can just use the source shorthand sum over. Then you don't need to state the sum token anymore because now it's obviously part of the name. And this thing is just going to implicitly assume that you want to start your summation with zero. Okay, so to make this really clear, because it's such a central concept, we are looking at this exact same thing again, but this time, time in animated fashion. So we have our left-hand side, which resides on edges. We have two other fields, which we want to consume, which um, reside on cells. We are stating that we want to run this stencil over the whole domain, which doesn't matter that much because we're only looking at a single horizontal slice, but be that as it may. So we're going to travel from our edge to the two neighboring cells. At these two neighboring cells, we encounter our two fields, and on both sides, we add up A plus B. Then we reduce onto the edge we started out from using the sum. And that's it. That's the reduction. So I believe it's um, useful to not only look at this visually, but we can also look at this in a generated code. So a generated pseudocode. So I don't think that there are any surprises here, except that this should not, equal, should not read equal. It should read plus equal. But model of this typo, we have no surprises here. We are iterating over the edges, and for each edge, we, iterate, we are iterating over the cell neighbors with this pseudo meshing library I introduced into my pseudocode. Um, yeah, just to make this really clear, we have one parallel for loop right over the edges, but the reason we uh, have only one loop nest here is because we didn't specify a vertical. If we specify a vertical as well, we get our expected two uh, for loops, parallel for loops. And then uh, per edge, per thread, so to speak, we do the uh, summation over the two neighbors in, in serial. OK, and the first generalization of this concept I've introduced, want to introduce is weighting. So in the previous examples, all of the operands in the reduction were weighted the same, namely by one, if you want to make this really explicit. But there may be a situation where this is not appropriate. Um, so here in the middle of the slide, we have an example, which uh, is not very useful, but at least it tells you the syntax of how you can weight a reduction. So here you have this weight field and you divide by it. Um, so this should be clear from the syntax you have seen beforehand. And here on the right hand side, you have this weights vector with two entries where you say, well, I weight, you want to weight each of the operands in the reduction by one over W. Um, so 
one thing which I need to say here is that Dawn is not going to assist you with the number of weights. So you need to figure out that a edge has two cell neighbors and then provide the correct length of a weights vector on your own. So this is maybe something which we will need to look at the, in the future. But currently, uh, there is uh, no safety here that Dawn ensures that you are putting in the correct uh, length of weights vector. Uh, however, it also remains to say that we didn't gain anything by using the right version over the left version, because still we are weighting each operand by the same weight. We just use different syntax to do the exact same thing. Probably one could even state that the left-hand side is clearer. However, this stuff becomes useful if you decide to use weights which are not equal for each operand. For example, if you want to find the directional gradient across an edge by looking at the two neighboring cell values, um, you will always need to weight the value which you encounter along your normal by one and the other value by minus one, which we can express by putting weights equals one minus one. Or another example where you want to interpolate in a situation where you have two neighbors and uh, one uh, location you want to interpolate onto. So since interpolation weights always need to add up to one, you can still express this with a single field and you can construct the weights vector by putting one minus alpha and alpha to get this probably in most cases linear interpolation translated into dusk. Um, I would say there are not too many more examples where this is reason uh, important uh, for with the concepts we already know, but combined with other advanced concepts later on, this will become even more useful. Like it also is important to state that this would not be feasible or only feasible in very awkward ways if we would not support this uh, weights concept. Um, again, I think it might be useful to look at uh, the code which Dawn would emit in such cases. So we basically have the same loop structure, but what Dawn now does additionally on a conceptual level is that it prepares a weights vector just before we enter the reduction. And we also carry along a linear index, which goes from one, sorry, from zero to one, or from one to two, if you are a Fortran person, um, to be able to address this small weights vector in the inner loop. And here we manually increase this linear index. Okay, uh, maybe a little bit besides uh, what we are talking about right now, but still sort of important. Uh, some over is not the only shorthand we offer. We also offer other shorthands uh, for, for example, for the minimum and maximum. So I think this is maybe something which you um, might have missed so far that we can also offer constructs to not only sum up and multiply or do whatever to our neighborhood, but that we can also reduce in the actual sense our neighborhood in choosing a singular value by, for example, choosing the minimum or maximum. Okay. We're already reaching the end of the second block. <coughs> ah, sorry. Um, we briefly want to talk about control flow, which is also something I believe um, uh, have expected that there is in Dawn, like every programming language over the sun, over the sun, under the sun, has some sort of if then else construct. And uh, yeah, we are no different in Dawn. Um, you can write if and else inside uh, your stencils in a pretty straightforward way. Um, for example, here in the example on the left hand side, um, we are iterating over all our edges. And if we encounter an edge with a value of lower than 10, we are just adding 10 to it. And otherwise, we are only adding 5 to it. And you can see the translated example on the right-hand side. So 
yeah, no rocket science here, I believe. Maybe it's just important to really make clear that this is evaluated for every entry in the field and not like for the complete field and the neither for the complete field, the lower or upper execution is executed. Uh, there is a small caveat, like I explained to you, that we currently do not support um, float fields. Sorry, no, we only support float fields. We don't support Boolean fields. So you need to emulate this somehow. So currently, probably the safest option would be you just for you zeros for false and ones for true, and then explicitly check uh, for the one condition in your in your mask. All right, let's wrap things up. So what can we do in Dawn so far? Uh, we can do arithmetic on fields, as we talked about plenty before the break. We can introduce control flow. So for example, here we would have a simple boundary condition stencil. We get in a mask, which tells us which edges are boundary condition on the boundary and which are not. And well, for the edges on the boundary, we set the velocity to zero and for all the other edges we do something with the velocity like we evolve it in time or um, solve some ODEs on it or whatever and probably maybe most importantly we can reduce from one location to another so here for example we would find the edge average um, for a cell by looking at all our uh, edge neighbors and we divide by three to get the average. And if we are so inclined, if we do not want to divide by three outside of the reduction, we can also divide by three inside of the reduction uh, using weights. Okay, what else have we learned this morning? Uh, we learned that Dawn always tries to make your code safe. Um, and not only safe, but run safely in parallel. And if Dawn fails to do so, Dawn will just uh, resort to serial execution for small bits, hopefully small bits, such that you're still efficient. In turn, you need to make sure for Dawn that your code is uh, consistent in location and dimensionality. And yeah, Dawn will also reject code if it's uh, inconsistent. Um, you will see that the combination of these concepts is already quite powerful. Um, we will do an exercise after the break where we um, compute vector analytical quantities. Like this is powerful enough to uh, compute gradient divergence, uh, curl, and even more. Uh, and this next session, this reserve uh, refers to the afternoon where we will look at uh, more advanced concepts and maybe more interesting concepts in Dusk and Dawn. All right, so it looks like it's time already for me to take your questions. Okay, let's see if there are questions. Okay. Um... So I read the first question from uh, Sebastian. Is there an option to use weights in reductions if the number of neighbors is not constant? Uh, for example, vertex to vertex in an unstructured grid. I don't have a real world example in mind. I'm just curious. Um, well, you short answer, no, not really. Because, yeah, I mean, we thought about it that you would basically if you have an uns if it's your mesh is fully unstructured and you will never know how many neighbors you're gonna encounter, then it, the concept of weights is hardly meaningful because you would need to um, provide uh, different weight factors for every different number of neighbors. But if you cannot make any um, uh, assumptions for over your, about your mesh before you run the code, then this is hardly meaningful. Like it could be useful, for example, if you have a semi-structured mesh where you know that I'm encountering these three possible neighborhoods, and then you could design uh, three uh, different weights vectors for the situation. 
but currently we have no plans uh, for Das Canton to support this. Uh, maybe I, I can add that there is a, a simple case we, we uh, think we'll uh, support is that when you can have, um, I think the possibility is five or six neighbor when you go uh, uh, vertex to edge. Um, and in that case, you could use a weight vector, which is of uh, size six. Uh, but then, of course, if you are in the case in which you have five neighbors, the last um, weight is going to be ignored. Yeah. Um, but then yes. not general if you, structure, of course. If you can find a reasonable example where just ignoring the last weights is a reasonable alternative for the five neighborhood, yes. Uh, okay, the next question from uh, Daniel. Uh, do you support larger stencils um, like for, uh, for a given cell uh, loop over all vertex neighbors uh, or similarly for a given cell loop over cell neighbor, neighbors plus neighbors of the cell neighbors? This would be necessary for higher order finite volume polynomial reconstructions. Well, this is a very excellent question, and I would like you to wait until the afternoon where we are, dis where we are discussing exactly these kinds of situations. And the short answer is yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so the uh, next question from uh, uh, Matt. Uh, when uh, you were dividing the old sum over by W in the weighted example, is this valid code? Is W not defined on cells uh, and the LHS defined uh, on edges or possibly vice versa? Uh, just trying to understand what is valid in these cases. Um, let me make sure that I did not, did not mess up this example. So let me quickly find it again. Um, where did I have this? I'm just going to scroll back because it will be faster, right? We know our max over here. We have the weight on cells and we have the LHS on cells. So this should be fine. And here in the sum over, yes, this should also be fine because if we look at the code, we, um, well, is this the same example? Um, okay, now it's slightly different, huh? I think, um, oh, this is the weight, the reduction already. The short answer is yes, this would be fine because it's the weight is on cells, right? And the uh, left hand side. Uh, is there a typo on, the... on edges? Yeah, I think the, it's a typo. The weight should, uh, W should be on uh, edges also, right? Yes, W should be on edges also. Well, the other says it's on edges. Yes, let's say that the W to be an edge, so we go with the cells. Yeah, it's so as well, the outcome yeah. of sum yeah. over is on edges yeah. and W is on edges. Yeah, actually, you're, you're absolutely right. If you're pulling it outside of the sum over, then this is not meaningful because we cannot address it. Yes, yeah, thanks for the help. And yes, you're absolutely right. This, this is wrong. This should be, it's not valid if it's outside. Okay, thanks for the observation. Thanks. Good catch. Um, so uh, th there is a question being written currently by Daniel. So uh, uh, I think we, we have time until uh, 1030, right? Yeah, I mean, to me, the question is now a little bit if I should um, <coughs> introduce the exercises now so people can take a break and solve them at their leisure or if you want to take a break for all the people and introduce the exercises after so i'm flexible okay um yeah, uh... Let's uh, 
finish with the questions, I guess, first. Um, so maybe, okay, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start reading the question from Daniel. Uh, oftentimes the weights are uh, an integral part of the operand. I do not fully get why you syntactically distinguish between the operand and the weights, uh, like when looping over the edges of a cell and multiplying each edge value by either plus or minus one. From my point of view, this multiplication by plus or minus one is simply part of the operand. Um, yes, you can take this as part of the operand, but then you would kind of like need a special field which is able to store a value per operand uh, for each location. And this is also something which we will uh, talk about in the afternoon. Um. Okay, I think um, we have no more questions. Um, so, uh, is as you prefer, you can, if you want to go ahead already, um, explain the exercise uh, so that people have more time to, to look at it. Uh, your call. Um, yeah, I believe let's do it this way. So, 